All right, so let's start. Uh, welcome to the Azure Bakery. Uh, well, my name is Robin. I always leave my last name out because translating into English is not a success. <laughs> um, I'm a principal cloud engineer at Linkit. Um, and to already answer one of the first questions, uh, we're gonna share the slide deck at the end of this session. Uh, and the session is also recorded. So um, let's get started. The Azure Bakery. Um, because of the available time today, we're not going through everything in the series. Uh, I do recommend going to the series to further explore and solidify the information in this session. The last slide deck of this de uh, last slide of this deck contains a link to the series on IT Next. Um, and at the end, I'll also go to to one of the um, um, blog posts I, I wrote. So, the Azure Bakery. The idea behind this series is to approach Azure in an easy to understand and fun way. Uh, the goal is to engineer and deploy solutions in the best way possible, while at the same time, we're trying to keep it simple. We will go, uh, we will go through the foundational layers of every solution you may want to build in the future. So what ingredients do you need when building these solutions? Let's start with the first layer. We start at the bottom and work our way, all, uh, work our way to the top. Um, so let's start with Azure Active Directory. Now, when you sign up um, for an Azure Active Directory, you get a tenant. And this is an Azure Active Directory instance, it gives you the possibility to uh, create identities. And these identities are necessary for um, yeah, managing access to your Azure environment. And this Azure Active Directory tenant represents your organization. It's the first layer of our cake. And we will go through identity and security. And there is a lot more to it, but today we'll just look at multi-factor authentication and conditional access policies. And, oh, let me, something in the way. All right. And because of, all these capabilities, it's really um, essential to configure yeah, these, these basic services. Oh, I hear somebody else, is mic? Okay, it's, it's gone, all right. So first, let's start with multi-factor authentication. This service adds a second form of authentication to the user's sign-in process. So when the user signs in, the user is prompted for an additional form of identification, such as approving uh, the sign-in or providing a code, finger, or face scan, depending on your configuration. Handling these requests is often done through a second device, like your phone. So when you only use a password to authenticate, you leave an insecure attack vector. All right, and this, uh, yeah, this image, see my mouse. This image is um, my own multi-factor authentication um, verification when I log in and then the authenticator app on my phone gives a pop-up and I have to um, authenticate using my face and then I can approve the request and, and sign in. So this way yeah, you're, you're yeah, more secure, so to say. The next thing I wanna uh, talk about is uh, conditional access. And you see this image here, conditional access, um, give you the ability to create policies. And these policies are evaluated when you sign in or when you wanna access a resource. With conditional access, you can bring signals together to make decisions, uh, allow access, require MFA or block access, um, using if then like statements to keep your organization secure and optimize um, the user experience. And signals include like user and location um, device and application or real-time risk. And this real-time risk um, is based on AI and that determines if the IP address you're, you're using to log in is safe or not, or um, yeah, a lot of other capabilities. So, and um, I forgot something by the way. So let's first go back to these identities because I just skipped the whole part about user accounts, service principles, and managed identities. So and, um, you know, to access and manage your Azure environment, you need an identity. 
This is essential for authentication and authorization, where authentication is the process of verifying who you are, whereas authorization determines what you can and cannot do. Let me say that one more time. Authentication is the process of verifying who you are, whereas authorization determines what you can and cannot do. So you have different, yeah, multiple different accounts you can create, like user accounts. The, the, um, these accounts enable users and administrators to log in and work with Azure. Um, when, authenticate, uh, when authenticating, the user needs to enter a username and password. And if you set up MFA, uh, you also get a multi-factor authentication request. Service principles, on the other hand, uh, allow applications and automation tools to access and work with resources within Azure. So authentication is handled by a combination of the application identifier, the app ID, and a secret key or certificate, where the certificate is a, a better uh, authentication mechanism. And the last one I want to talk about is managed identities. They provide an identity for resources within Azure. So these identities can be used, for example, to access other resources like secret keys inside an Azure key vault. Uh, I'll, we will be looking at this um, in the demo at the end of this presentation. And when you use a managed identity, you don't have to manage the credentials. Azure manages these for you. So, all right, MFA we talked about, conditional access we talked about. Um, and this is a summary of what we talked about in uh, yeah, this layer, right? We went through identity, user accounts, service principles, managed identities, and we looked at MFA and conditional access policies. The next one, next layer that builds on top of Azure Active Directory, management groups. Management groups are a crucial aspect in managing access policies and compliance across Azure. So a management group is like a container for your subscriptions and allow you to apply governance to all subscriptions within that management groups, management group. So it simplifies the, the, the subscription management. And you can also create policies, assign the policy to a management group and the underlying subscriptions automatically inherit um, these policy configurations. So you can organize your subscriptions in yeah, subgroups. What I want to look at in this layer um, is also the enterprise scale landing zone architecture framework or landing zones. Um, and landing zones um, consist out of management groups and subscriptions. So the core of landing zones um, yeah, is built build out using management groups and subscriptions. And even though the landing zone framework is initially meant for enterprises, it's beneficial for every organization. So it allows you to design your management groups and subscriptions and thereby your Azure environment in a modular, modular and scalable way. Next thing I wanna look at in this layer is Azure Resource Manager. Azure Resource Manager or ARM, um, is the management layer you use when you interact with Azure. And I wanna specifically look at the consistent management layer, the scopes and the ARM templates. And what you will see when we look at scopes is that most of the layers from the cake um, will be represented within the scopes. All right, first let's start with landing zones. Now, landing zones represent a multi-subscription Azure environment that includes security, governance, networking, and identity. They take all the required resources into account and make sure these are available when you're engineering and deploying your solutions. A good analogy to a landing zone is the set of services required to build a city. All right. Oh. It's my space bar. Before creating buildings and people moving into these buildings, certain essential services must be in place. Think about power infrastructure, water and sewage facilities. And that's what you're trying to do when you create a landing zone, like anticipate on, okay, what do we need? What is going to land on 
uh, on our Azure platform and how we're going to make sure all these services like uh, Network Watcher, Security Center, cost management, monitoring, logging, policies, identity and access management, et cetera, et cetera, are available. You know, shared services, for example. So you, you won't have to deploy like Active Directory in instances for every workload, but you can centralize these instances uh, to save costs and to simplify your management. Okay, this is a, yeah pretty comprehensive image. <laughs> um, but what you'll see here in the middle, let me switch to my laser pointer. Uh, what you see here in the middle um, are like management groups and subscriptions. And these are branching out around the center. And what you see here, for example, this landing zone subscription is, is like basically a subscription with, with yeah all the required resources or infrastructure and that's necessary for the application is gonna land in this landing zone. Then you see a connectivity subscription here, a management subscription, identity subscription. And at the top, you see, your, see the Azure Active Directory here. So um, Azure Active Directory, management groups. Next, we're gonna look at subscriptions, et cetera, et cetera. But um, now the first level in every Azure tenant, this one here, the so-called tenant root group um, is, is a built-in management group and it allows you to apply governance at the directory level. Create a top level uh, platform management group here on the left to combine and govern the subscriptions used for the foundation of your Azure environment like identity, management and connectivity. The top level sandbox management group here on the right allows your organization to experiment with Azure. The sandbox is isolated from the rest of the environments. So what you do, you, you create, for example, two sandbox subscriptions here. They're separated from, from the rest of the, of the environment and maybe you have a different policy set that applies to this management groups and automatically is inherited by these underlying subscriptions. Next, what we're going to look at is ARM as your resource manager. Like say it here and here. And Azure Resource Manager is the service for managing and deploying resources in your Azure environment. ARM enables you to manage your resources by using the available tools like the Azure Portal, Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI, or other yeah, REST clients, um, where the Azure Portal and the Azure CLI communicate with the Azure Resource Manager through a software development kit, SDK. And they're all talking to the same um, yeah, the same API or the same endpoint. Of course, this is distributed across the whole uh, Azure environment. But what this will give you is consistent results um, using uh, yeah, different tools. And all these tools have like the same capabilities. So I can, uh, the things I can do by using the Azure portal, I can also do with PowerShell and also do with, a, with the Azure CLI. Well, that's the idea. And most of the time this is, uh, this is possible. Next is ARM scopes. Now, when you work with ARM, you have four levels or scopes, management groups, subscriptions, resource groups, and resources. And if we look at our cake, then we have another one here on the top. It's called Azure Active Directory, and then we turn it upside down. But um, yeah, these are the scopes. The lower levels inherit the settings. So for example, when you assign a policy or management groups, the subscriptions that are belong to the management group automatically inherit um, the policy configuration. And management groups usually have multiple subscriptions, um, subscriptions, numerous resource groups, and the resource groups, various resources. ARM also gives us the, the possibility to work with templates. And these Azure Resource Manager templates or ARM templates um, allow you to implement infrastructure as code for your solutions. And working with infrastructure as code has several benefits, like lowering the potential for human errors, uh, identical environments on demand uh, by using the same tem uh, template multiple times. Um, and this will also give you a cost reduction because you can just create your test environment, deploy your application, run your tests. And when that's done, you can just remove your environment again. 
So you don't have any yeah, sitting resources that, that don't do anything but just cost money. ARM templates are written in JSON, uh, JavaScript object notation. And this is a lightweight data inter-exchange format. And JSON is easy for humans to read. Well, not everybody agrees, but, um, uh, and write. And easy for systems to parse and generate. So working with ARM, just like using the Azure Resource Manager uh, endpoints, gives you repeatable results. You're able to deploy the same resources in the same way. And they allow you to automate your resources deployment by integrating them with your favorite CI CD tooling. So, what we looked at in our management group layer um, is the enterprise scale landing zones or landing zones where we looked at management groups and subscriptions. And we looked at Azure Resource Manager, um, yeah, the layer, the scopes, and the templates. Next up, subscriptions. Subscriptions in their simplest are containers for your resource groups and resources. So when you deploy and use resources, the costs are built to your subscription. So the subscription is like your agreement with Microsoft and allows you to use their platform and their services. Subscriptions are mandatory. So when you want to deploy resources, you have to have a subscription. Without them, this is not possible. So what I want to look at in subscriptions are yeah, different design strategies um, and cost management. So somebody drawing in the presentation screen, but remove that or something. Oh, no. Oh, well, let's go on. So design strategies um, give you more, um, so I just lost my focus because somebody's drawing on the screen, but all right. So design strategies, uh, every organization is different. Um, and therefore management groups and subscriptions are designed to be flexible. There are multiple design strategies for management groups and subscriptions. So we're gonna look at these. Uh, and um, I wanna look at cost management because Azure enables you to build and deploy um, solutions that leverage the clouds power by using the needed resources and performance. So you have like performance on demand, but eventually you're paying for the resources and services you use. So therefore it's crucial to manage your costs. All right, design strategies. The first one, workload separation. So this is the most straightforward approach. You have two management groups, one for production, the one on the left, uh, and one for pre-production, the one on the right. So I'm like, acceptance, test, staging, whatever. And both management groups contain multiple subscriptions, A, B, C, and D, uh, where ownership or responsibility is the differentiator. The next one I wanna talk about is the application category design strategy. And this one bu builds on top of the workload separation approach by adding application categories under the production and pre-production management groups. This workload, um, sorry, the workload categories are different for every organization and are based on various topics, such as business criticality, access controls, data protection needs or compliance requirements. And because they're flexible, you can combine strategies as well. And the one you'll see here, um, adds like the geography uh, on top of that. So you have a business unit, two, two locations, and then you'll see the production, non-production subscriptions uh, and the resource groups here. A uh, good thing to keep in mind is that the management group hierarchy uh, can be six le levels deep. Um, so uh, take that in mind when you design your, your management group um, hierarchy. All right, cost management. Cost management starts with proper planning. What services to select? Uh, which service tier or virtual machine size do you need? And start with collecting the requirements and use the Azure pricing calculator to estimate your application's cost. 
and design your workloads as efficient as possible. Focus on consumption models where you only pay for the number of transactions or runtime of the application, like an Azure function, for example, uh, and use managed services when possible. Although the cost per unit for these managed services is higher, they have lower operational costs because you're not managing the underlying infrastructure. Um, Azure is doing that for you. After deploying your solution, you should regularly review your costs to optimize your resources and Azure spending. And Azure cost management, the screenshot you'll see here in the, in the slide, shows you where your money is going and is integrated with Azure Advisor to advise you on underutilized resources. So it will tell you if a VM is, is oversized or you have yeah, sitting or still resources. And cost management also allow, allows you to uh, configure cost alerts. Uh, these will notify you when a budget or department spending quota is reached. Uh, setting up these budgets and quotas supports organization, uh, organizational accountability. Are we staying within our budgets? All right, that was the subscriptions layer. So we looked at design strategies and cost management. The next one is resource groups. So again, resource groups are also containers, but this time for your resources. They give you a way to group them together. Uh, resources in a resource group usually share the same life cycle and can only exist in one resource group at a time. You can move, add, or re remove most resources at any time. All right, there's sometimes dependencies and, and sometimes it doesn't do what you want, but um, yeah, it gives you flexibility. And when you create a resource group, you need to provide a location. Um, and this location is also a region. The resource groups contain metadata about its resources. So that's why I specify the location. And by specifying this resource group's location, you're selecting where the metadata, metadata is stored, um, which can be essential for compliance reasons. If you delete a resource group, you delete the resources located in that resource group. So you cannot just remove a resource group, you'll be removing everything that's inside of this resource group. All right, I wanna look at regions. So what is a region? It's a set of data centers to ensure high availability. Um, and I wanna look at a naming convention. Um, so naming scopes, what are these, um, and components. So naming co uh, convention components. And it's good um, to have a solid naming convention because this is essential to identify your resources. So um, yeah, it's, it's all starts with, with proper planning. All right, regions. Oh. Again, the space bar, nice. Uh, regions, Azure is a global cloud service platform that comprises of two key components, um, the physical infrastructure and the global network. The physical infrastructure at this point consists of more than 160 data centers divided across 54 regions, uh, and they're all connected to the global Azure network. So a region is a set of data centers to ensure high availability. Each region has a pair, and this pair is another region, <laughs> preferably located at least 300 miles or 482 kilometers apart. So this is not always possible, um, but that's, that's what they're trying to do. And most of the pairs are directly connected. So it's recommended to utilize a regional pair when you replicate data or you build and deploy multi-regional workloads for, for extreme high availability. And for example, the regional pair for West Europe, uh, that's, uh, that's here, is North Europe, that's here. All right, naming scopes. So it's, it's not possible to rename resources after you've deployed them. So it's essential to establish a naming convention before you deploy resources or migrate production workloads. And all resource types have a naming scope that defines the scope in which the name should be unique. Um, the naming scopes are global. So then your name have to, has to be unique across all of Azure. 
a resource group, then the name of the resource should be unique within the resource group or uh, the resource attribute level. And then the resource, or uh, in this case, for example, a subnet, uh, should be unique within that virtual network. So you cannot just create the two default subnets. They all have to be unique. So it's yeah, it's good to, to keep this in mind. For example, a key vault has a global naming scope. Log analytics workspace, global naming scope. Most resources that are um, by default publicly accessible uh, all have a global naming scope. All right, so when we create a naming convention, what are the components we have to think about? We have to keep in mind. So Microsoft advises a naming convention that starts with the resource type, um, followed by the um, workload application, the, the environment or the, produ yeah, the stage production development, the region and an instance number. And the recommending um, the recommended naming components, um, abbreviations for resource types and limits are, are really important. So there are certain limits uh, on specific resources. For example, an, an, um, Windows virtual machine cannot have a name that's longer than 15 characters. A storage account, 24 characters. A storage account cannot include like a dash while a, a virtual machine name can. So all these uh, yeah, limits you have to take into account when you design your naming convention. All right, so we looked at regions, we looked at the naming convention, um, naming components and, and the naming scopes. So last layer, resources. Um, we're gonna add resources to all the previous layers. And with these resources, the layers of the cake really come together. So that's what we're going to do here. And we're going to look at the design recipe. So, hey, what's the recipe for, for these resources or the recipe for, for the whole cake? And we're going to bake it. And the baking I already did. So I already deployed the resources because I don't want to mess with, uh, <laughs> with Azure when I'm trying to do, it, do a demo. So. First, we're gonna look at the design recipe. And um, it's based on the enterprise scale landing zone architecture framework, like you can see here. We have like the, um, oh, come on. We have the tenant root group here, uh, followed by uh, the name of the organization. Um, I created a platform management group and under the platform, I created a management, management group. Uh, on the right, you'll see a landing zones management group with, uh, with a corporation management group underneath. And both management groups uh, contain a subscription. So in this case, a management subscription and a landing zone subscription. And what I did uh, was already deploy the resources you, you see here. So, and the management subscription contains a log analytics workspace for centralizing uh, the logs, metrics, and other data, like you can see here, this, uh, this dotted line here. And the landing zone subscription, this one, uh, includes the web application based on an app service app here uh, with an Azure SQL database as a backend. And the app service app uses a system, system assigned managed identity so this is one of the two variants of a managed identity to access and retrieve the Azure SQL server connection string from the Azure key vault. So this app service app has an identity that um, that's included in the Azure key vault access policy, and it can um, yeah, extract the connection string to connect to the SQL server uh, instance that's running as a backend. And I included two uh, deployment slots. So these uh, yeah, allow you to first deploy into staging and then swap it into production uh, and give you the ability to swap it back. So you can pre-stage your, your application and then uh, yeah, set it live. And uh, I also included four Azure Monitor alert rules to monitor the web application that's running in this landing zone. All right, so let's start baking let's do this click here oh. 
All right. So, um, this arrow is really annoying, but. Okay, first we're gonna look at the management groups. So uh, we have like the tenant root group here uh, or here. And um, inside the tenant root group, I created um, a Rubino management group um, and I created a landing zone and a platform management group. And these management groups include like this corporation and this corporation includes the landing zone subscription. And the same goes for uh, platform. Platform as a management management group and, and that includes the management subscription. So if we're going to look at the resource groups I deployed, um, I deployed a management group, uh, to me, at least uh, a management resource group, man, all these groups, uh, inside the management subscription. Uh, and I created an app resource group inside the landing zone subscriptions. And the management group resource group contains the management log analytics workspace for centralizing um, the logs, alert, uh, alert data metrics have audit data metrics, I have to say. So that's this one. And this application resource group contains like the, yeah, the whole workload. So we have an app service plan. Uh, we have the app service app. We have the staging uh, yeah, deployment slot, whereas the production deployment slot is, is configured by default. We have the key vault. We have the SQL uh, server and the SQL database. And if we, for example, look at the app service app and we go to identity, you'll see that the system assigned a managed identity is enabled. It has an object ID. And now this application has an identity uh, inside Azure Active Directory. So you can assign permissions using uh, this identity. And what I did, um, was create a access policy inside the key vault that includes the managed identity of the application. And this access policy, access policy allows the application to use its identity to, to get the secrets. And the secrets, we're not able to view them now, but if I add myself um, to an access policy, so just give me, uh, give me everything for now, All right? Um, get myself, add myself, and don't forget to click on save. Otherwise, it's gonna take a long time before your access policy is active. And if I go to secrets right now, I'm able to see the secrets. So what I did while I was deploying the resources. Um, right, uh, I wrote the SQL connection string um, as a secret to this key vault. So if we open this and we go here and we say show secret value, then here is the secret. Um, and the secret is the connection string the application uses to access the SQL database backend. So if we go back, um, what I also did is uh, write the SQL admin username. Um, to the key vault and also the SQL admin password. So if you ever need it, it's inside this key vault. So you don't have to write it down or, or whatever. And if we go to the application and we go to configuration, my arrow is pointing nicely to the middle. <laughs> you see the default connection um, is based on a key vault reference. Uh, type of SQL server. So this way I don't have to mess around with the connection string myself. So did I forget anything? Uh, maybe, uh, no, no, I don't think so. How are we doing time-wise? I still have six minutes. Let me, let me switch back. I just wanna show something else. So if we go to the key vault, for example, um, and we go to diagnostic settings in this case, and then you'll see that, that the diagnostic settings are being uh, written to the log analytics workspace that's centralized um, in the management subscription. So if we deploy different applications or uh, we create more landing zone subscriptions, they can all use the same log analytics workspace because it's outside of that subscription and it's like, like centralized, it's like a shared resource. And that's the whole idea behind enterprise scale landing zones 
so you you already trying to think about what you're gonna need, uh, yeah, what, what you're going to need in the future, and then you already yeah create these these modular building blocks, so to say. So um, all right, then that was my presentation. Are there any questions? No, nothing. <laughs> nothing yet. Ooh. All right. Uh, I forgot to show the um, the resource resources um, blog post I wrote, but uh, I will share it anyway. This is recorded. We're going to share the slide deck, and um, that includes like a, a link to GitHub. Um, so you can, uh, yeah, and a step-by-step -step tutorial to deploy the exact same workload I just uh, showed you. So you can just follow along, uh, read, and, and deploy yourself if you want. So. Hi, Robin. Um, Ankita here. I just have one question. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what I see is in the key vault, we have the secret and also the uh, connection string of the database, which is encrypted. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the app service, let's say that if we have a PHP application, which is running into an app service. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, inside an app service, how is it, how the app service, uh, I mean, the PHP code would be able to read those secrets. Like, um, I don't understand the flow over there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's possible. I'm I'm not sure if it's possible within PHP, but or uh, for that matter of time, like any language, maybe a .NET yeah, or yeah, a yeah. Java, yeah, any language. Yeah, yeah. There are there are different SDKs, and I think you can use the SDK mm -hmm. for your for your language of choice to mm -hmm. um, leverage like the key vault functionality. So um, okay, um, yeah, it's possible. It's possible, and I, I, you can also use that managed identity that's that's mm -hmm. inside of your, well, at least the managed identity of your app service. Mm -hmm. uh, you can leverage that inside your application to do other things within your platform if you if you want. So. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. No questions. No questions. <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's finish off then. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was muted, but okay. Uh, thanks all for uh, joining us today um, and this tech night with uh, Robin. Uh, Robin, of course, uh, very much appreciated. And uh, to show our appreciation, we, yeah, well, actually we sent you a gift uh, to your uh, office, so, uh, I think you will receive it anytime soon. Um, thanks again, uh, everybody at home. Thanks, and um, yeah, have a good good night. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Samira. And uh, yes. 